contrasting circumstances on coaches' night, but heading towards major events in the Anzac round. The Demons are unbeaten. They're 5-0. and zero. They've stared down every challenge so far. And now Richmond to come. While Collingwoods have absorbed the wounds in recent weeks, they're 1-4 and four with their big date coming against Essendon on Sunday. Nathan Buckley, welcome back to AFL 360. Okay, Jared. Simon Goodwin, good to have you here. Good day, Jared. Robert. Hello, Goody. How have you come back from Perth? One and four with fresh wounds. How would you describe your, your scenario? Quite plain, mate, yes. just to be sarcastic. Yeah, but, um, no, no, we, um, yeah, we're definitely uh, not where we wanted to be and where we plan to be. We the, the early part of the season hasn't been um, you know, what we'd hoped for. And a lot of things that we'd worked on through pre-season haven't really um, panned out well. So, you know, over the last couple of weeks, we've, um, you know, taken pause. We're having a look at the way that the game's settled, what we've got at our disposal, and looking at the best path forward. So that was a large part around um, Darcy going forward. Um, and that was there was some encouraging signs with that, but clearly it opened us up at the other end. Um, and, yeah, we need to find the balance to be able to execute our brand more consistently and then we'll get an idea of where we sit. How difficult is that to do early in a season? Oh, well, everyone starts, you know, with, with the same challenge, I suppose. And, um, you know, our, our list dynamic is, is a little different to the last two or three years where we've introduce more youth. We're not quite as deep in, in terms of experience. Um, but um, until recently, we've, our injury profile's been pretty good, so we can't, I can't sit here and say that injuries has, has cost us in, in, in that uh, sense, but we just haven't been able to click as a unit. We haven't found our best, and, and the challenge for us is to do that. When you say pause, mo most observers say, and you may not agree, mm -hmm. that you're too defensive. So when you pause, you're looking at personnel, you're looking at game style, you're looking at everything. Part of that sort of recalibration of moving dancing forward, is that a change of attitude from you as coach? Oh, I think it's just an acceptance that um, what we have forward of the ball hasn't worked for us. And it's been over... You know, we were really good in 18. You know, we were pretty... We were OK in 19. And last year was difficult for everyone to assess, you know, what was actually working and what wasn't. Um, there was so much that was happening off the field that was pulled onto the field that, that was a challenge. But, um, you know, defensively, we're, we're stacking up really well. I mean, the Ds are, um, yeah, have been criticised, I suppose, for their defensive um, efficiency and, and would be as good as anyone in the competition so far after five games and still bringing the, the offensive um, balance. So. That's what we want. We, we want to be. We are a, a, a very good defensive side. we um, we defend turnover really well. Uh, we defend the ground really well. We're hard to move the ball against. But that's good for one part. We need to be able to, you know, have some hurt factor going back the other way. And we're looking for that. How how, how are you situated? Um, last year of your contract, you're one and four. You know your name's going to come up in discussions. Everyone's yep. started talking about it already. Are you able to just ignore all that and able just to concentrate in the group? I think 2017, it might have seeped into the group. It was pretty fierce. Oh, yeah, that, that? No, I think in the end, you either allow it or you don't. And as a, there's more than just the senior coach that takes the leadership role. But I've you know, spent my whole life being judged internally as much as externally. So you really? Can, you sort of get used internally to it. Internally? <laughs> no one could... No, mate, you do. Seriously? But you, you, I think you, you get used to it, and I'm a lot better at handling it now than I used to be. So um, I think I'm in a better position to be able to handle that scrutiny, even from three or four years ago. Because largely my job is about what happens, what happens back to the coaches, back to the players, um, maintaining a the composure of not getting caught up in the moment and, and being able to see the bigger picture of what we're heading towards. And that, I think that's really what the senior coach's job is as much as anything, is, is, is selling the positivity of possibility rather than getting caught up and, and finding the things that are working now and reinforcing those as much as it is, finding the things that you need to improve. I just want to ask him one more, Goody. Yep. One more. So there's been a, 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 a very track for, for Collingwood, I think. You're bringing in a lot of kids, you're trying so keen down back, Darcy forward. A sort of a semi-rebuild of your list is going on. 
semi-major, whatever you want to call it. You're sitting out in this path of doing this. You desperately want to continue next year and, and continue rebuilding this football club because it's begun. It's begun in the first five weeks this year. So it's a real reset for the club and, and, and for yourself. How can, are you super keen to, to coach next year or do you think that will be a decision that you and the club will have to make at the end of the year? I, th I think it's a decision that the clubs and coaches make um, at different points of their of their journeys. Whether you know, my my, journey, my my travel or my journey with Collingwood has been intertwined for a long period of time yeah. now, um, on the field, off the field. I mean, I I have a great passion for the club. I have a great passion for helping young men make their way through it, and we've been challenged quite a bit on and off the field as an organisation, and I think. We've, we're, we're taking great strides towards being a better organisation um, and we want to be a better team as well. But you look at our win-loss at the moment, we're one and four and I, I, I've, I'm accountable to that. I find, you know, I'm, I take responsibility for that. But I also, I, I don't think it's dire. I, I think that we have, we have some youth to, to look forward to, but we also have some connection pieces that we haven't been able to find at this point that I'm pretty sure that when we find them, that we can be a very good team in the short term. So it's not just about long term next year or the year. You, I still think we can be a good team this year. Do you desperately want to coach this football club next year? I'm, I'm desperately doing that right now and doing it to the best of my ability. To next, and next year? Well, I'm contracted at the end of the year. So I, I understand where you're trying to go with this. I, I, I just want to understand I, your passion. I know your passion's yeah. strong, but I don't want you to... You shouldn't have to beg for your job and go on TV, but I'm just trying to get a, a handle and on how, des how desperate... I don't have any desperation in me at all. I'm really focused on what I'm doing right now and I believe that if I'm doing that job to the best of my capacity and the people around me are thriving and blossoming, well then that's what a senior coach's role is. If they're not and if, they're, if change needs to occur, well then I'll be a part of having that conversation with the club. Um, and Wrighty's been in the chair now for 11 weeks and he knows the game really well yep. and I'm pretty sure that he brings fresh eyes to have a look at that. Um, and I value his opinion and his perspective. Um, but our CEO's been there for three or four years. Um, yeah, we've got a fairly established leadership group in the playing group and, and our coaching panel is largely established. Um, so whether we're too... Um, whether we, we're, whether there's, there's enough fresh ideas there, but we've just got to, we've got to execute. Um, if you don't win, like no one, like if you don't perform well on the weekend or over a period of time, a player has selection feedback. <laughs> I think that happens for us as on, 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 a, on a little bit longer timeline, but it, but it happens. Mm. Does five and zero, so this might have been your conversation, Simon, coming into the year. You wouldn't have yeah, been oblivious to that. Everyone wanted to fire him yep. six yep. weeks ago. So five and zero, does that... No, they didn't, did they? <laughs> oh, I think they did. <laughs> <laughs> You were hot. You were hot going in. Is it helpful to bury that at the start and just get that out, out from the four walls and go about the business of improving your team? Yeah, it's really important to, to get off to a fast start. I think any club wants to do that. And more importantly, you want to establish how you want to play. And, um, you know, I think our players have led the, the way in that. Um, you know, they've established how they want to play, how they want to be seen, and um, it's a good start. But as we know, you know, footy is uh, an industry where you need to respect the competition and there's still so much work to do. Did you, when Bucks was talking about finding that balance between defence and offence, were you sitting to yourself, three years we've been looking for this balance and you seem to have got it right at, right at this, this moment. Your defensive one and two in really a lot of indicators and your offence, like killing, you know, just running over Hawthorne yesterday, was really encouraging. Have you got the balance near enough to right? Yeah, look, we've, we've spent some time establishing how we want to defend and uh, that's taken some time, but we've stiffened up behind the ball and it's allowed us to be more aggressive in other phases of the game and we're getting great rewards. Like what? It. Like what? Can you explain? Oh. Yeah, we've got great trust in our back six. So our ability to play the game in our forward half, we can be more aggressive in that. And that's enabled us to put a lot of pressure on. So um, we're winning a lot of contests behind the ball and um, you know, it's giving us a chance as coaches to play a certain way and our players are really buying into it. The trust that you've spoken about repeatedly um, through these first five rounds, can, can you define that for us? How, how do you find it? How do you instil it? How do you believe in it? I think there's a selflessness that starts to permeate through the group. 
Um, there's a maturity. They start to understand what they want to stand for, what they're prepared to sacrifice for each other and what it takes to be successful. And I think you've got to go through the challenges. You've got to go through the adversity. Um, you've got to go through the failures to really get that. And we've got a core group of players now that are 24, 25, that have played 100 games, 150 games, that now understand that. And that takes time. And, uh, you know, it, uh, it's not an easy thing to get to. Um, and you've got to go through those challenges. But as I said, we're, we're in a good place right now. It's now how we nurture that, how we foster it, how we keep moving forward and how we keep improving. Still, it's always up to the leaders to lead the way on the ground. You've got some rippers that have been developing. You've got your, your captain, Max Gorn, who, you know, everyone says Nick Natner is the best tap ruckman in the competition. He may well be, but I don't think there's a better contested mark ruckman around the ground. He took eight yesterday. Yeah. Eight in, in, in one game was, was enormous. How was his change in the selfless attitude that you talk about? I'm not saying he was selfish, yeah. but how much has Max, the captain, really pushed the, um, the selfless attitude? Oh, he's been a big part of driving it. You know, he's, he's got a core group of guys around him, you know, Jack Viney, Jake Lever, um, Stephen May, um, Alex Neil Bullen, that are really pivotal in driving how they want to be seen. And, and Max is continuing to stand and evolve as a captain. And you, know, you speak about hit outs, and you know, we've had this conversation a lot about the correlation to, to win losses and hide, but what he's doing around the ground and where we can position him behind the ball mm. or in front of the ball is significant. But as you see, he's owning his moment and he's doing a great job of keeping the players really connected um, and in a really good space. I think number five's going okay as well. What do you think? He's going well. Um, there's no question about that. You know, he's, he's continued to evolve his game. He's, uh, he's one of our best trainers at the footy club. Um, he has been for a couple of years and it's full credit to Christian. You know, he's, um, he's put a lot of work into to becoming the player that he is and he's got a really good baseline to his game. What a correlation that is. The, the really good players are the best trainers. He was the best trainer. Her was the best trainer. Vossi was the best trainer. At Adelaide, how were you? Rue, what was Rashido like as a... <laughs> and when, you, you were you quit while you're ahead, mate. <laughs> <laughs> Who are you having a go at him or a shooter? Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, well, well, the penny dropped a little bit later for Rui, but he got there. <laughs> but that, isn't that a, that's the correlation. Yeah. Carey was the hardest trainer at, at North Melbourne. Yeah. Who's at Collingwood? Don't tell me it's Buck, um, Pendlebury. Pendlebury. There's, yeah. there's an absolute correlation, yeah. isn't there? There's no secret to being a successful player. And it, and it can take time. Some players do it in the first two or three years. Other guys, it takes four or five years. But to be the player you want to be, you have to become the best trainer. Was Jeremy Howe a better result than you feared from the box when he went down? Uh, yeah, in some ways. So it's scar tissue. Um, and in many ways, that was a probability rather than a possibility okay. of happening. Um, obviously his knee injury was significant and, and taking uh, a tendon graft out of the hammy causes some, um, yeah, some trauma as you'd expect. And he's re rehabilitated really well, but he has had a little bit of soreness in that area over the last sort of two or three months from time to time. So um, it bled, it bled. I read, I read the, the release today. Scar tissue yeah. from a knee operation bled yeah. in. Is that yeah. rare or is that... He's uh, human. He, he bleeds, <laughs> Not really. He, jumps, he does jump on heads. Oh, look, he, and even then, like, when you look at the first couple of rounds, and maybe this is something that needed to happen for him to get back to, to absolute full fitness because he, um, he's sort of been running... I reckon he's been running around about 90%, but we, he's, I've seen him in a few situations, probably a handful where he could have... where he'd normally sit on someone's head. And he's sort of not not quite going or not able to get up there. So um, there's been a bit of inhibition in his play, and he's still been really effective for us. He's been a good player, and we'll miss him. Um, but I think that um, you know we, we can't understate the significance of a PCL injury first and foremost, and then um, the, the, the surgical intervention that had to happen. So we don't know how long it's going to be. Um, we're treating it like a standard hamstring, and then see how where we go from there. So three to four as a guide. Um, but even our medicos are saying there's a little bit of unknown about how it settles and how quickly the blood clears and then where we go from there. Was the mobile phone incident a misdemeanour or when you first learned of it did you just say how does this happen like most people are asking? I'd have to look up the meaning of a misdemeanour but all I know is that the bloke was the bloke we're talking about that grabbed the phones was, had just been omitted from the game for concussion. Um, so you're not thinking straight. Should someone be there to help him think straight? We're a little understaffed at the moment, Robbo, after COVID, so most of our people were hands on deck. I hope you're listening, AFL. But 
the main issue there is that you know that Geordie, you know, we had a couple of injured players, and the bloke that went and grabbed the phones, he, you know, he, he wasn't he wasn't deemed well enough to continue to play a game of footy because of a head a knock to the head. So that's that's pretty. I don't think he was thinking straight. Okay, and if he had been, he wouldn't have picked up the phone. I wouldn't that have thought so. People would know that. Correct. The old no, the players are. Edu I mean, once again. We are human and we do make blues and sometimes we make, you know, we're assuming that, that we're assuming the worst here. We, we, make, we make all of these rules and assumptions and that someone's going to pick up a phone and ring someone and say, here, put a million bucks no, on we, this. We protect against the worst. We, we do and, and I understand that and we do as a football club as well um, and we take full responsibility for this situation, no doubt, but uh, Geordie De Goey was concussed. All right. Uh, to Saturday night and Sunday with our coaches next, the feature matches of the Anzac round, of which they are key parts. On the couch follows us immediately. Not too far away. Jared, Brownie, Rue and Gaz. The Moment, brought to you by PointsBet. There's just players everywhere at the top of the goal, so we're going to have a repeat ball up in the Giants forward line. They trail by four. And then it's 16 now. Not a drop of energy left, except for Kelly! Kelly slows on the ball. Oh. Josh Kelly oh. has put the Giants in front. It's Kelly that puts them in front. It was a bloody good game of footy. Oh, I said to Mummy, tap it over the back. I'm just happy he went through. I was having a bit of a shock at kicking night, so to hit that one was good. So we're all thumbs up on those Giants jumpers oh. too. Um, you, Simon, you brought the Melbourne jumper that you'll wear on Saturday night. H how has this grown in significance for what, uh, for what the footy club um, gets to share in? Oh, we just we just feel really fortunate to play in such a, you know, privileged game, you know, to honour, you know, the, the wars and the, the veterans and the Anzacs. It's just, it's just great. You can see around the poppy there, we've got 30 players that have represented our, our country at war and um, they're represented with their names on the Guernsey. So it's a, it's a really special occasion. We're very proud to be involved in it. It's going to be a cracking game. How good the tests of Richmond right now? Yeah, look, it's going to be a cracking test. You know, they were, um, you know their second half against the Saints was they were right back to their best. And, um, you know, they've been the benchmark for a number of years now. Clearly, they're the, the team to beat. And, um, you know, we're looking forward to that challenge. We want to see ourselves. You know, we feel like we're in really good form and, you know, we want to go against the best. And Nathan Jones will be on the couch shortly. He reaches game 300. This is going to be um, so well received, I think, right across the football community. Yeah, it is. You know, Nathan's been just a warrior of our footy club. And, you know, for a really proud footy club, he's only going to be the second person to play 300 games behind David Neitz. And, um, you know, his ability to withstand um, adversity within our footy club and, and see this journey through, it's just great for Nathan to be a part of what's starting to grow within our club. And um, it's going to be a really special moment for himself, Jerry, and the kids. And we're looking forward to sharing it with him. Many years ago, Ross Lyon and Phil Walsh in a game at, between um, Adelaide and um, Fremantle put Nathan Fife and Patrick Dangerfield on each other. Can you just or orchestrate uh, Dustin Martin going to Dustin... Um, Christian Petrarca going to Dustin Martin? Yeah, just I'll for a photo. I'll please. give Dimmer a call and see what we can get done, but no. I've got a funny feeling they're both going to be veering off from the same <laughs> bounce heading in different directions, so... Then someone else will be picking up their yeah, man. so they both play forward into forward half of the ground, so, uh, yeah, we might see the centre bounce, but after that they'll be uh, they'll be heading in different directions. So but you won't be looking and applauding Dusty like everyone else when we watch this great player? You'll be saying, how do we stop him? Oh, that'll be one of our primary focuses as coaches. You know, he's a very important player. Are you tagging? Tagging's coming back yeah. into the competition. It disappeared for three, four years, but it looks like it's it's coming back. You've used a couple. Have you? Yeah, we've, we've used a couple. Um, Is it know, harms? And, harms? At certain times in games and certain periods, depending on players. But, um, yeah, we'll certainly look at Dusty, what's best for the team and how we structure up and, and utilise that. But, yeah, I, I'm in favour of tagging if the if the match-up's right and the, and the game state's right. 